So welcome back to Animal Form and Function for Biology 1200 at Vancouver Community College. Uh, we were talking about uh, animal form and function in general, some development of complex structures from simple structures. So animals that are single cell, like an amoeba, that can just diffuse um, materials across its membrane easily with the surrounding water all the way to very complex um, animals that have to have many infoldings and large surface areas of structures in order that all of the billions of cells in their bodies will get the nutrients that they need and be able to get rid of wastes. So the human body, for example, has uh, about one quadrillion or so cells and about nine quadrillion bacterial cells that help us out. And they also need nutrients. But sometimes they help us get nutrients, particularly the ones in the large intestine. So we talked about hierarchy going from uh, cells that perform all the functions of life. But in order to um, service a large multicellular animal, the cells have to get together as tissue, work together as a team and do things like muscle contraction to move um, a body. So what we're talking about now is the second level of hierarchy, tissue. And I'm talking about um, mainly mammals and tissues, not because not all animals have tissue. So, um, the hydra that we looked at, for example, does not really have tissue. It's just got two layers of cells. But something like um, a crab, another invertebrate, it's got lots of tissue. Clams, another invertebrate, loads of tissues and organs and organ systems. But let's just talk about tissues. So what are they? Tissues are technically groups of cells that have a common structure and function that usually work together collectively. There's four major kinds of tissue, epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. And they're classified because of their structure and function. So epithelial tissue generally lines cavities and lines the outer body and ectoderm. Um, connective tissue is mostly what it says, so it connects things together with fibers, um, it connects epithelial tissue to underlying muscle tissue, for example, um, but it also includes blood. And most of connective tissue has uh, sparse cells, but quite a lot of matrix, which is the material outside of the cells, like bone, for example. Muscle is a kind of tissue that is contractile. And there are three kinds of muscle we'll talk about, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and skeletal muscle. And nervous tissue is a communicating tissue. So neurons individually um, are useful, but neurons need to communicate with other neurons. Neurons need to cause muscle contractions and gland secretions. So epithelial tissue covers the body and lines organs and cavities. It's very specific in its shape and its structure. Sheets of closely packed cells. They cover surfaces and they line cavities and they line tubes. They're not always a single sheet of cells, though sometimes they are stratified. The functions of epithelial tissue include things like uh, protection. So your skin, for example, protects you against pathogens and secretion. Uh, cells, for example, that line ducts, such as mammary gland ducts, secrete the products of milk in that case, and exchange. So blood vessels are lined with epithelial tissue that exchanges gases, for example, with the surrounding tissue. So here we go with the different kinds of epithelial tissue. Let's start with A. 
simple squamous epithelial tissue. One layer, as you can see, an underlying basement membrane, that's a bit of matrix that allows the tissue to attach to underlying connective tissue. The cells have nuclei as most cells do in um, most animals, except for red blood cells. And this is very simple squamous epithelium. Squamous, flat, um, such as those that line the air sacs or the alveoli of the lungs. So they allow for exchange because they're also kind of leaky. Cuboidal epithelium has a different structure. The lining kinds of epithelial tissue, simple squamous, is good for exchanging material because it's thin, thin layers that have uh, gaps within them. But epithelial tissue doesn't necessarily produce a lot of stuff, but cuboidal tissue does. Cuboidal tissue is Q-shaped. It has a lot of volume relative to surface area. So it generally lines tubes and other ducts, producing products to excrete. So cuboidal tissue, uh, large volume to surface area. Relatively. So it has the volume of cytoplasm, to make products. Like hormones, for example. Columnar tissue is column shaped. So it's long and skinny. And as such, it has more surface area to volume ratio. Therefore, there's a lot of surface area for exchanging material. You find this kind of tissue lining things like the intestines, which need to absorb nutrients. Stratified squamous epithelial tissue is such stratified in order that the lower cells can replace the upper cells that tend to be lost. So these are, for example, lined in the esophagus. The human skin includes layers or stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Your skin is constantly losing cells and must be replaced. So simple squamous lining Lines, for example, the cardiovascular system, lines your arteries and your veins. It lines air sacs of the, of the lungs. It's somewhat leaky for gas exchange and nutrient exchange. There's one layer. One layer assures efficient diffusion and absorption. So this is a, a blood vessel. And you could probably recognize some of the structures. For example, here are your red blood cells. They're discoid shaped, so they're kind of obvious. But these other cells here, the long skinny ones, that's the nucleus. That's the nucleus. These are squamous epithelial cells, and they line the blood vessels in order that material can be readily exchanged with the surrounding tissue. One layer. Cuboidal tissue, lots of cytoplasm. It might, for example, line a salivary gland. So you can always tell glands because they're, if you're looking at them through a microscope, there is a clear section in the center, usually surrounded by cells. They're not obviously cuboidal, 
but those are the shapes of cells that line ducts, for example. And in the case of the salivary gland, produces saliva, mucus, serous fluid, electrolytes, and such. Columnar epithelium, a large surface area, like the digestive tract. So if you're trying to identify different kinds of tissue that we're talking about, sometimes you can by comparing the tissue that's close by. So I know because I've done this a fair bit that this is smooth muscle here, and that will be surrounding um, the intestines, for example because the intestines have to move food through via peristalsis, must have muscle surrounding it. Connective tissue connects epithelial tissue to this muscle. It also allows for things like blood vessels to flow through it. And then you've got your, not a very clear picture, but these are villi and each villus is aligned with columnar tissue. So those are all columnar cells. So the surface area is increased not only by these villi that stick out like that, but each of the columnar cells that line the villi, they actually look more like this. They have what are known, so these, let's call these villi. These are the villi lined with columnar cells. And this is one columnar cell with microvilli. That increases the surface area even more. So form fits function, large surface area, lots of absorption from the intestines. There's another good picture, but better, the duodenum. There's a, a villus is singular. So one large villus here, and these are all columnar cells. And usually the nuclei of the columnar cells are close to the bottom. And that's because all of the digestion is going on here. And for the, cell, the columnar cells that have the microvilli, so I'll just show a couple of microvilli there. Um, they have actin, which is a protein that's contractile here. And say you have a little parcel of food coming in. There's the food. It gets absorbed through endocytosis. There it is there. And what will happen is that the microvilli will get shorter and shorter because the actin contracts. And that brings this piece of food closer and closer to the cytoplasm of the cell itself. And that's how it's drawn in. Lots of surface area. There are other cells involved in digestion. Some of them are known as goblet cells, and they secrete mucus. The microvilli increase surface area. Cilia are an extension of cells as well, epithelial cells, but they're longer. So microvilli are just quite short. Cilia are longer. You find them in your ears. You find cilia lining um, the trachea and the bronchi, so your respiratory system. You also find them in the pancreas and pancreatic ducts. They move um, stuff <laughs> into your intestines. And you find them also in the uterine ducts. So they sweep eggs down the uterine tube. So this is a transmission electron microscope image. That means it's a very thin, thinly sliced specimen. And you can see the cilia here. This is from a, a rabbit trachea. That's a longitudinal 
section. And these are cross sections of cilia. A scanning electron microscope image will show it in three dimensions because the electrons from the electron microscope, they build up and they form a three-dimensional image. So those are cilia. What is the function? Move particles. And the trachea moves pollen, dust and stuff from your lungs. Uh, and the fallopian tubes or the uterine ducts moves the egg. And the pancreas moves digestive enzymes. So this is what I was trying to draw before. Here's the esophagus. This esophagus is layered. It's stratified. Why? Because you're eating things like chips and whatever else you eat during the day. And the roughage causes the cells to, um, to slough off, essentially. They get broken off and they have to be replaced. This is in the esophagus, so it's non-keratinizing. In other words, there won't be keratin, a protein, in the cells. So here's your circular cell here, your longitudinal cells. We talked about that before. And peristalsis will move food items down the esophagus. And again, here's connective tissue. And smooth muscle will be underlying that because the esophagus also functions in peristalsis, just like the intestines do. Uh, this is the oral cavity. So the inside of your mouth, this is connective tissue and this is epithelial tissue, also stratified because you're replacing that tissue all the time, the epithelial tissue. The skin, so what I mean by keratinization, the cells are keratinized in that they store keratin, which is a protein um, in the cells, the cells themselves dock. So your skin cells on the surface are dead cells, but they have keratin in them, which is uh, water resistant. And it is also um, pathogen resistant. We all have different ways of taking care of skin. <laughs> this is a uh, character from one of the Star Treks. I can't remember which one. So that was all about epithelial tissue, very specific, um, usually very thin with squamous tissue. There are also cuboidal cells, single layers. Sometimes they're stratified, but they're very tight packed cells, whereas connective tissue is not tightly packed. Usually there's just a few sparse cells and what is known as an extracellular matrix, not necessarily a gel, there are different kinds of matrices. Let's see. Mainly, I guess you could call the function binding and supporting other tissues. There's lots of functions of connective tissue. Let's look at A, loose connective tissue, like, for example, under your skin. It's very sparse. Here are the cells here. Not very many. They're known as fibroblasts. And they create or form fibers out of protein like collagen. So this is a collagen fiber. And you can tell because it's wavy. Collagen is always wavy. That means it's distensible, not elastic. It won't stretch, but it's distensible in that you can make it longer because it's wavy. So that's why when you hold onto your skin and pull at it, it doesn't come all the way out to here, unless you're Elastigirl. Um, your skin stays attached to the underlying tissue by connective tissue. Um, fibrous connective tissue is also collagen. Few cells. This will, and it's wavy, the collagen is wavy, but it's tightly packed, unlike the loose connective tissue. And uh, that makes it strong because they're parallel. So for example, a tendon. Adipose tissue is included in connective tissue. Uh, I think because it stores fat. So here's one adipose cell um, and inside will be one fat droplet.
Cartilage is another kind of connective tissue. These are lacunae with cell inside, and they form cartilage, like you would find at the end of a bone, which is also connective tissue. This is the uh, central canal, the Habersian canal. And that's how blood and nerves get to bone tissue. You replace all of your bone tissue uh, about every 10 years. And blood, blood is considered also a connective tissue, connects various parts of the body with arteries and veins. It's got the red blood cells and white blood cells. So let's take a look at loose connective tissue. There's three kinds, collagen, reticular, and elastic. The type of cell, the main type of cell, there's more than one, are fibroblasts. You find it beneath the epithelial tissue in the skin. You find it around your organs, keeping them in place so they're not like ricocheting off your abdominal wall, for example. Um, and they form protective layers over nerves and muscles and blood vessels. And there are various tissues. So the, the largest fibers like this one here is a collagen fiber. They're the thickest ones. Other ones may be reticular fibers or elastic fibers. So elastic fibers are very thin and you find those where you need more flexibility, uh, like under your skin, for example. So you're your skin is flexible, but um, it doesn't break if you pull on it. These are fibroblasts. I like this picture because it shows very uh, highly magnified cell. This whole thing is a cell, but also shows the pieces of um, collagen that are being excreted. Sorry, I need some uh, water. Yeah, so that's a fibroblast, it secretes the proteins that make up the fibers. But uh, as you can imagine, your loose connective tissue, because it has space, so you'll find immune cells like this one, plasma cell, that produces antibodies. If you look closely, so here's the nucleus, but look all around it. This is all rough endoplasmic reticulum with ribosomes. Why? There's a lot of it because that's where antibodies are produced. Antibodies are proteins, and that's where they're produced, plasma cells. They're also macrophages, and they wander around your body, uh, the body of animals, and phagocytose waste in foreign bodies like bacteria. Mast cells also very important. They contain histamine and heparin. They're involved in the inflammatory response which happens when tissue is injured in some way. And you can see these vesicles, these large vesicles here, that contain histamine and heparin. Adipose is another connective tissue, it's really easily recognizable. Often the, you can hardly even see the nuclei, this nucleus here. The nuclei are usually shoved over to the side because the inside of the cell is a fat droplet. Um, what is the function of adipose tissue? Well, it stores fat, stores energy in the form of fat, really. Um, cushions, organs, for example, and things like your eye. Um, and it is an insulator. It keeps you from getting cold and it especially insulates your vital organs. Blood, 
another connective tissue. It's a fluid matrix um, called plasma. And the plasma contains water, salt, proteins, lots of other things. The cells are known as um, leukocytes. Those are white blood cells that we see, white blood cells, and erythrocytes, which is misspelled here, erythrocytes, which are red blood cells. Sometimes they're easily distinguishable, as we saw before. The function of the red blood cells is to transport oxygen to the body, and the leukocytes is functions in immunity. This is a nice uh, cross section here of ligaments. So it shows uh, bundles. These are bundles of collagen fibers. So you can see how densely packed they are. That makes them very strong. And they also are somewhat flexible in that they're distensible. Yeah, they, they won't uh, stretch out if you have just a piece of stretch out, but they will extend because they're wavy. And I like this diagram too. This is actually a micrograph of a ligament, dense fibrous connective tissue. Strong because it's packed together, but also somewhat distensible. Bone, another connective tissue. Um, it has lamellae. So those are layers of fibers. That's bone material. And Haversian canal, that's in the center here, that transports blood and nerves. Uh, lacunae, they're all over the place. Each of these lacunae contains uh, an osteoblast if it's a functioning cell. So when a cell is functioning like a fibroblast, or an osteoblast, it means it's producing the matrix like bone. But if it's not producing any way, anything, it's called an oste it's called an osteocyte. That's non-functional. Sometimes they're just um, dormant for a long time until they're needed again. And cartilage is sort of similar to Bone, but it involves chondrocytes. Those are the inactive cells that produce the material of cartilage. So they also have lacunae here, the lacunae with the chondrocytes inside. And cartilage is smooth. Um, it's a um, polysaccharide and protein matrix that's you find um, some kinds of your ears, for example, your cartilage in your ears and nose, uh, but also at the ends of long bones to prevent friction between bones. And sometimes that can go a little bit awry. If you've done a lot of sports in your life, for example, you might have worn down some of that cartilage. Okay, now I'm going to stop the lecture for now, and we're going to do a short online quiz. Let us look at muscle tissue. Muscle tissue functions in movement. There are three kinds. Count them. Three. One, skeletal muscle, voluntary moves the muscles of your arms, your legs, cardiac muscle, involuntary, pumps blood throughout your body. You only find it in the heart. Smooth muscle moves the walls of internal organs, such as the stomach, intestines, uh, blood vessels, and esophagus. There are some different ones that you can recognize by their structure and their structure, just like everything else, fits their function. You know, connective tissue has lots of different functions. 
but in each one of them, the structure fits their function. So loose connected tissue, few cells, uh, a few fibers, lots of room for blood vessels and nerves and um, some immune cells. Structure always fits function. So let's look at a skeletal muscle. Long, that's its structure. They're long because they're having to connect, say, your upper arm to your lower arm in order to move it around. So that fits their function of moving some long bones. Um, they're striated. These are called striations. That allows the muscle to contract simultaneously. And you need actin myosin for that, of course. Oh, oh, also, they're multinucleate. So one cell will have many nuclei. Why does that structure fit the function? Well, as such a long cell, it's going to need a lot of product. Lots and lots of proteins like myosin and actin that uh, are part of the striations. They'll need that all along the length of the cell, so it's good to have lots of nuclei. Uh, let's see, cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle, um, you can't tell here very well actually, but it is also striated. I should make a note of that, it is striated. Um, it also has these lines, those are known as intercalated discs. You've probably heard of those before. There are gap junctions that allow the cardio, mus the cardio muscle cells also to contract uh, simultaneously, but in a kind of a wave. So for your heart ventricle, for example, uh, the top cardiac cells will contract first and push the blood towards the bottom and then push it out of the ventricle. Also long, but branched. So cardiac muscle, unlike skeletal muscle, tends to be branched. And smooth muscle is really what it says. It is smooth. So that's a muscle. They're kind of uh, spindle shaped like that. They'll have one nucleus. So they're uninucleate, they're not multinucleate. But they're tightly packed together. And last but not least, nervous tissue. So nervous tissue forms a communication network. How does it fit its function? Well, um, it has lots of extensions. So this is the cell body here. Um, it has a nucleus. And here's a nucleus here that also shows within it a nucleolus and these small structures known as nissel bodies. So nissel bodies are basically a rough endoplasmic reticulum. There's lots of them. So they can produce a lot of proteins that are needed along the entire neuron. So these are neurons. These are the neuron cell bodies, but the extensions are dendrites, or one of them, possibly this one, it does look like the largest one, is an axon. Can't always tell, but that's probably the axon. And the rest are dendrites. So their structure fits their function because they have all these communicating extensions that will communicate with other neurons around them. So they can integrate information. And they're also very long. Some of your neurons have to go from your spine all the way down to the bottom of your feet. So they're quite a long structure and that fits the function of innervating feet, which is a long way away from the spine. Okay, that brings this part of our, our investigation into animals into a close.
So um, we talked about doing comparative anatomy and physiology. So comparing different animals, and that's how uh, we find out how these different animals function in nature. So we did look in the beginning at um, some very unusual animals like uh, the bird that held the chicks inside its feathers. Uh, we looked at the octopus that changes its colors and moves around with, um, with its long arms. Um, we looked at spiders that produce spinnerets and can fly through the air. So um, we study form and function. Usually our question is, how are these animals surviving in their habitat? How do they feed? How do they have offspring? Where do they live? Because we, as humans, of course, we're um, basically almost controlling almost every natural system in the world now because we're so widespread. So it's our job to find out about them and make sure we can conserve animal life and all life on, on Earth, of course. So um, another reason also for comparative anatomy is to see where animals are as far as evolution goes, like which animals are related to which. Sometimes we use comparative anatomy for that. Uh, comparative physiology, sometimes we use that. Humans will look into that uh, partly to see uh, what animals need in their particular environments, but also um, to see how they might compare to human physiology. So you can't always study humans if you're trying to find out something. So sometimes we study animals for that. So we looked at a comparative case study of herons and humans, uh, saw the differences in, for example, their digestive systems and the forms of their digestive systems that fit their function. And that theme carried on throughout this particular lecture as we looked at hierarchy, cells that form tissues, that form organs, that form organ systems, that form an entire organism, and how does their structure fit their function. Um, we also looked at uh, various kinds of tissue. So the four main kinds of tissue are epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue and nervous tissue. And we use the theme that form fits function, looking at all the various tissues. So I hope you enjoyed that and bringing the lecture to a close.